Hi everyone, Ben from the Microbiology Society here. I'm at the Excel Centre in London for New Scientist Live, a giant exhibition of the latest science and technology. We're going to go and have a look around now at some of the exhibits and we're going to talk to some microbiologists about their research. Hi everyone, I'm here with Dr. Sheena Cruikshank from the University of Manchester and she's just given a talk all about the hygiene hypothesis. So in your talk just now then, Sheena, you were talking about how, how really now humanity has reached an absolute peak uh, in terms of our, our, our quality of life and our lifespan compared to how it was you know, hundreds, thousands of years ago. So, so why do you think that is? Well, I, I think sort of the evidence points to the fact that we have good access to clean water, um, we have toilets that flush and take away our waste, that's probably the most important thing, we know how to deal with our waste. And then we've got access to drugs and vaccines that can either cure or prevent disease. I think it's, it's kind of those factors, because in the countries that still don't have that kind of infrastructure, that lack the, the toilets and perhaps lack access to the drugs and hygiene, we still see that their longevity is about the same as it was, so their average lifespan will be 40, which is what it used to be in the UK about 150 years ago. So good, solid public health infrastructure is Basically, the Basically it is, and using the vaccines, using the drugs. I mean, that will basically prevent disease or cure disease. One of the things you were talking about was uh, about cleanliness, though, how uh, things are sterilised a lot more now, and you can think you can walk into any supermarket and see aisles upon aisles of antibacterial, antiseptic, or whatever it is. You can find it in, in just about everything. Um, and you're also talking about how potentially we're seeing higher levels of allergies as well. How, how do you think the two things might be related? So what we've seen is, is that since, since we've started to live longer and we've got a lot cleaner, we have less infections now, we've seen a sort of rise in allergies and also autoimmunity. And these are both occurrences where your immune system um, misresponds. So in an allergy, it's reacting to something harmless. In autoimmunity, it's basically reacting to yourself. It should ignore everything that belongs to you, but it doesn't, it starts reacting to you. And although genetics play a role, so you are, if you've got a family member, you're more likely to have this, the environment seems to be much, much more important. And what they've noticed is that in, if you live in the, the sort of city and you've got a very small family group, then you seem to be more likely to have something like an allergy. Whereas if you live in the country and you've got a massive family group, you seem to be less likely. And that made them think that perhaps it was because these sorts of people were getting more infections, they were getting you know, more training for their immune system, or it's because they're getting more exposure to to environmental bacteria uh, and that kind of shapes the bacteria that lives in or on us um, and so that's one idea but then the other idea is that we all evolved to have worm infections and we got rid of the worms so back in in history we know in the UK that worms were here and when they found King Richard III's remains under the car park they quite quickly ascertained that he had a worm infection he actually had a roundworm infection it's quite a heavy infection um, and even if you look at our crusaders, we worked out that they also had worm infections. They've, they've looked at the latrines and they can find evidence of worm infection. They've looked at old Roman remains and again, they can find evidence of worm infections. So these were things that were with us in history. And it's only relatively recently that we eradicated them. And the type of immune response that you develop to get rid of a worm is exactly the type of immune response that you have to an allergy. So is it that our immune system was trained to deal with these things and now we don't have these things, so it goes wonky and starts reacting? So it seems like then the balance is the key. The immune system doesn't want to be too busy or inactive and you need to have a good, uh, diverse, maybe microbiome, people are researching that, or maybe sort of worm infection in, in my guts. And my question to you then, could it be that we could use worms, round worms, hookworms, something like that, as, as maybe a, a way to treat a way to treat the, you know, asthma or something like that? Well, there's been a lot of interest in that. So people have been doing that. There's a research in America particularly using a pig version of whipworm and that's used to treat inflammatory bowel disease and that, there's clinical trials running 
for that. And one of the thoughts is that what the pig whipworm does, because it can't survive in the human host, so it will hatch, and that's enough to change your gut microbiome, and that gut microbiome becomes better at making, helping program your immune response to make T cells that kind of shut things down. That's the kind of thinking there. And then they have used things like hookworm as well to try and treat asthma. Um, but the problem is, that we don't know how people are going to react to worms. Some people have a very, very bad immune response to worms and they'll get very, very sick and they could actually get a lot worse. And worms don't make you feel very well. I mean, there is a reason why we wanted to get rid of these things in the first place. So perhaps it isn't quite right to have worms. Even though there is black market, you do get people who self-infect and I meet quite a lot of those that confess to me that they take worms which is kind of disgusting when you think about it because the way that you get a lot of these worm infections is by eggs which are passed out in the poo. So basically you're eating something that you don't know what it is that's come from somebody's poo. And I wouldn't do that on the black market if you paid me. I want to know exactly what I was getting. So there's interest in using worm products. So worms make all these different products that are also able to manipulate the immune response. And I think that's where some of the most exciting research is in that area. So there's the research all over the UK in lots of centres looking at particular parasites like hookworms, schistosomes and whipworms to seeing how they manipulate the immune response. But I suspect the worm thing is simplistic. It's not just the worms, it's not just the microbiome because the environment is important too and our environment has changed massively over the last sort of 50, 60 years. So I think we also need to look at what's going on in our environment. So we actually have very, very little data about what the ebb and flow is of allergy patterns. Even people with asthma, they will go when they need their prescription filled when they're going for the checkup. Again, we don't know when they actually feel well, when they feel bad and where they were. So it's trying to get hold of that data for the first time to get a much clearer picture of what allergies are doing in the UK that will enable us to try and unpick questions like, is it the pollutants? Is it a particular pollutant? And that's what Britain Breathing's about. So this is a citizen science project where we want everybody to take part. It's free to take part. You can download the app um, and you can see all our data. So all our data is being shared with our users. We are already starting to make the map of when the allergies are happening and where they're happening. And so we know that April and June, for example, were two really bad months in the UK for allergies. There was a lot of people feeling very, very unhappy with hay fever at those months. And that's probably the first time that kind of date has ever happened in the UK. My student flat should have made me essentially immortal given the state of it. <laughs> but yet here I am. So, I mean, what's the ultimate aim for this work? What are you hoping to, to achieve or learn from these studies? Well, I think one, we're hoping to get this map then we can start to do the correlations. We can start to see, does it link, do symptoms link with weather patterns? Because a lot of our users who helped us design the app in the first place, they thought that weather patterns made a big difference. So is it the weather that's publicly available? Is it particular pollens that are present? Or is it particular pollutants that are present? And as we kind of, the, the, the picture evolves over time, we'll be able to ask, probably answer questions like why your student flat has or hasn't made you bulletproof. Sheena, thank you so much for talking to us. You're very welcome, thank you.